everyone, and welcome to the School of Architecture and Planning at the Catholic University of America. Tonight, we have the good fortune of a last-minute addition to our spring lecture series. It will be delivered by Matthew Bell, Professor Matthew Bell from the University of Maryland. He's principal at Perkins Eastman in Washington, D.C. He's been active in the Washington-Baltimore region with projects ranging from new towns and neighborhoods to residential uh, projects mixed use buildings and schools. From 1994 to 1999, Professor Bell was the director of the Northeast Mayor's Institute for City Design, and he served as a juror for the Biennale events. Professor Bell's graduate students have won awards from the AIA and the CNU, and have twice won the Urban Land Institute Carol Pines Urban Design and Development Competition. Recent projects with Perkins Eastman include master plans for the town of Crown, Maryland, and the Macmillan site in D.C., right up the street. Dunbar Collection, excuse me, Dunbar High School in D.C., the new dining commons at Catholic University, just behind us, Cleveland Park Library in D.C., and the campus master plan for George Washington University and American University. Professor Bell is a fellow of the American Institute of Architects and of the Congress of the New Urbanism. His work has received awards from the AIA, the CNU, the USGBC, and the Urban Land Institute. In 2020, he was appointed by Mayor Bowser to the Historic Preservation Review Board in Washington, D.C. Professor Bell has degrees in architecture and urban design from the University of Notre Dame and Cornell University. Please join me in welcoming Professor Matthew Bell. I think so. I think we're ready to go here. Lorenzo, if you say we're ready to go, we're ready to go. We're ready. So thanks, Mark. Um, this lecture came about um, because I sent an email out about two weeks ago um, to a number of people in the academic community who I know, Mark's one of them, and said, look, I have a talk about Kiev and, and Odessa. You all might want to hear it. Because I think it's important for us as architects and designers to understand these places that are undergoing these horrible circumstances and this horrible, unnecessary, and unprovoked war um, and understand these places in the way we understand things, which is through design and through architecture. Because obviously, the design of these places meant something to these people um, over time. And as it so happens, um, the work that I've been doing in my research has been um, also intersected with a, a um, personal um, initiative where um, my wife and I adopted two children from Ukraine and uh, spent several times, several trips there. And so it's been the intersection of my professional life and my um, personal life. And it's been a rewarding thing to learn about these places in a unique way, um, such as taking trips to adopt a child. And it's morphed into a kind of uh, interest in looking at cities um, that have suffered catastrophic events and what sorts of um, initiatives these communities take um, once they try to rebuild after these events. So bear with me, I'll go through some history here. Um, let's see. Lorenzo promised me this would work. He obviously was making that up, but what's happened, Lorenzo? Is the mouse not on the thing? The mouse is too active. Mouse. Okay. What do you want me to do? Okay. Now will that work? Ah, oh, there you go, Lorenzo. Okay. So is that gonna? This isn't gonna work. This is gonna work now. I don't know, Lorenzo. Mark, <laughs> do a backup. No. Um, so, so I made three trips. Three trips to Ukraine. My wife and I. I made two, uh, made two of them with my wife to adopt children, and over made three trips over fifteen years. And obviously, when you have an interest in cities and in architecture, uh, what transpires in these kinds of um, trips, particularly when you go to adopt a child, is you have an immense amount of downtime. You see the child for an hour in the morning, and then the rest of the day, it's like, well, you know. So we had a wonderful translator at both times, and who were quite avid tourists as we were. And we spent a lot of time exploring these cities, 
um, which was quite rewarding to us. And, and I must say, unexpected. I didn't know what to expect of either of these places, but I've come to, to love them and um, really appreciate their beauty and their uniqueness and, and with some surprising things learned in the process. Now, we know today that there's ter terrible problems in Ukraine, and it is a horrible, horrible thing that's going on there. And I hope that the res one of the results of this talk is that um, you feel inspired to do something, even if it's just give a little bit of money or find some way to help these people, because this is a horrible tragedy that's going on. And, and, and you know, I, I don't need to explain to people the magnitude of, of this tragedy, just to say, um, I hope this personalizes it somewhat for you all, because it certainly is personal to me. Uh, there's the kids, um, when shortly after we adopted both of them, two girls, our little uh, Ukrainian princesses, and there they are today. Um, so they're the reason why I got to learn about these places, which is quite rewarding. And they're, in our family now, um, Ukraine is every bit as much a part of our DNA as Ireland or Germany or England or other things that my wife and I came from. So it's all part of our, our whole history together. So just a little bit about Ukraine. <clears throat> and it's a country, I think, unless there were problems there, a lot of Americans wouldn't really take that much time to, to find out about, um, unless they had family history and stuff. But <clears throat> it's important, first of all, to start with geography. Um, <clears throat> we do in our work, in, in, in our office, in my teaching, we always do scale overlays to understand how big things are. So, so when you look at Ukraine and you sort of lay it over Western Europe, you begin to realize it's an enormous country and it stretches from the Atlantic coast of France to uh, the Czech Republic, and east west, and from north south, from Tuscany all the way up to the Netherlands. And that is an enormous thing. And, um, you know, we've probably been to most of those places and it sort of helps us to understand them geographically in that regard. <clears throat> it's also important to understand some specifics about it. Um, the, the name, the word Russian and Belarusian comes from Kievan Rus, which was the um, a, collect, a, a sort of princely kingdom in the center of, of Eastern Europe, centered around Kiev that, that existed from the, the um, eighth or ninth century up until about 1240 when it was overrun by nomadic hordes. But the most important thing to know about that is that Kiev itself sits on uh, trade routes, north, south, and east, west. So you can see in this diagram on the right, trade routes um, that run from the Baltic states, um, you know, to what is now uh, Lithuania and Estonia and Latvia, down to the Black Sea and eventually to Constantinople, and then east-west across um, what is now Russia all the way over to, to Western Europe. So it was really a trade town, so trying to the grew because of trade. Um, you know, all of this talk that the PR and the, the stupid propaganda that's been put out by, by Putin about Ukraine not really being a country is just horseshit. Um, you know, and in, in fact, it, it did have its moments, like most places in this part of the world. Some places like Poland existed and then didn't exist for a period of time. And Ukraine, this is a map of Ukraine um, in, the, in from 19, the Ukraine Republic from 1919 to 1921, when it was absorbed into the Soviet Union. And I made the little red outline to show how big it was. It was a very, very large area um, of, of geography. Um, this is another map of the same area. You can see how much it extended further east into land of Tartars, the Tartar areas, and also into what is now Poland and, and Hungary and things. So it was considered quite large at one point in time. Um, when you overlay that, that um, uh, dimension, when you overlay that scale onto the current day map, you begin to see a little bit of what's happened um, over time is the borders change a lot. In this part of the world, the borders have changed a lot. They don't, they're not fixed. You know, in America, we have the Atlantic and the Pacific Ocean. That, you know, those are huge advantages. But, but here, um, because the topography is rather mild in most places, these borders are very, very uh, malleable and they have changed a bit over time. And we'll talk a little bit more about the impact of that. But that's a little bit of overlay of the, at least the 1921 version of the Ukrainian Republic overlaid on top of the current day. Now, when you start to look at territorial growth of how this all evolved and got this way, um, what's interesting is to look at the various things that happened over, over the course of time that either added land or took it away. So the purple boundary is the, per is the approximate Ukrainian Republic of Kyiv, a little bit smaller than the slide I just showed you. But you can see the way in which, you know, in 1922, 
Um, it was absorbed into the Soviet Union, which is in green. Polish territory, which was, says it was given to Ukraine, it wasn't really given, it was taken. But in 1939, by the Soviet Union, a Romanian territory is given, in quotes, to Ukraine. Um, and then various changes in the border with uh, the borders with Hungary and Romania. And then in 1954, the latest um, thing was Khrushchev gave uh, Crimea to, um, to Ukraine. And there are many people who believe that he just kind of got drunk one night and had some Ukrainian friends with him and said, oh, well, I'm going to give Crimea to Ukraine. But, but anyhow, that's pretty much how that all sort of played out. Um, in terms of population, it's almost 80% Ukrainian and 17% Russian, and then there are other populations there, which is, you know, um, a reflection of the borders of the country and where, where it sits. In terms of language distribution, um, as you might suspect, there are more Russian speakers in the East than there are in the West. Uh, Crimea is a place that has many, many more Russian speakers than Ukrainian speakers. And Ukraine, by the way, we'll talk a little bit about this. It's a language that's related to Russian, but it's also related to Polish. And sort of depending upon what sort of part of the language you're using, you can see the origins from those two languages. Not that I speak either language. I would love to learn both of them, but I've looked at it enough to sort of get interested and find out about that. Um, now, this is, I think, one of the most interesting drawings I've come across. When my wife and I were in, in Kyiv in 2000 adopting Anne Marie, the people we were dealing with were all Russian speaking. And I assumed that they were ethnically Russian, but just living in Kiev. But as I've come to find out, an actual fact is that he explained to me, they're Ukrainian, but because the Ukrainian language is suppressed for some time, many people of a certain age didn't really learn Ukrainian, they learned Russian. So when you look at this map, what you see is red is mostly Ukrainian speaking, but you can see in yellow Russian speaking Ukrainians. Um, so the Ukrainian language was suppressed, and what you see is, which is one of the mistakes Putin says, well, he wants to protect Russians and Russian-speaking people. Well, there are many Ukrainians that are very patriotic about Ukraine that were brought up speaking Russian. So the language thing is a bit more complex than many people would have you uh, believe. The uh, ethnicity um, in the bottom, you can see again that Crimea is a little bit of, a, of an exception. When you go back and you sort of unpeel this a little bit further, um, you begin to understand some things. Um, like many other places in Europe, it emerges as a concept. Nation, language, and ethnicity go together with, with place and nation building in the 18th and 19th centuries. So Ukraine, like many other places, like Germany, like Italy, starts to become the concept of it as a, as a country, starts to uh, become uh, an important uh, goal for many Ukrainians. Um, it gets partitioned several times. Part of it go over to Lithuania and then the Polish Commonwealth. Part of it goes to the Russian Empire. Uh, the right bank, which is the west side, belongs to Poland and the Lithuanian Commonwealth until 1793. And there was always a tension between them and the Russians. And the left bank, the east, had been incorporated into the Tsar of Russia in 1667. But most of, the, um, of Ukraine fell to the Russian Empire under Catherine the Great in 1793. So it kind of gets unified in, into the Russian Empire at that point in time. Um, the most important person to understand about, about this part of the world and to understand about Ukrainian patriotism and Ukrainian language, poetry, and arts is this man, Taras Shevchenko. Um, he was an artist. He grew up as a serf. He had to buy himself out of serfdom. Um, and he was a tremendous artist. I'll show you some of his work in a second. <clears throat> but he was a, a Ukrainian patriot. He, he was exiled from Ukraine. He spent time in prison, had a really hard life. But he was one of the people who really advanced and elevated the Ukrainian language and culture. Um, and even though some of it had been banned, and he got in, obviously, as you might imagine, a fair amount of trouble um, pushing a kind of uh, Ukrainian nationalism. Um, these are, this is him on the left with quite, a, quite an impressive mustache, I must say. But you can see these are some of his drawings. He was a fantastic painter and a fantastic artist, but also a poet. And he kind of codified and formalized a great deal of the Ukrainian language. What you probably don't know is that there is a statue of Shevchenko in Washington, DC. You've been down P Street, crossing the bridge into Georgetown, right? You've all done that. Take a look around. There's a Shevchenko statue there. This is really worth noting. It's a statue dedicated to the liberation, freedom, and independence of all captive nations. And this was put up there. This monument of Taras Shevchenko, 19th century Ukrainian poet and fighter for the independence of Ukraine, 
and the freedom of all mankind, who under foreign Russian imperialist tyranny and colonial rule appealed for the new and righteous law of Washington and was availed in 27 of June 1964. So in the 1960s, um, you know, the United States was recognizing that Ukraine was a captive nation, which was quite a long time ago, but rather extraordinary. You may have been here recently. Um, this is the Holodomor Memorial, which is down by Union Station, designed by um, Larissa Carillis with Hartman Cox. Um, this is a memorial in Washington commemorating the, the forced starvation of Ukrainians in the 1930s by Stalin, who was seeking to export grain out of Ukraine um, to uh, use the money, hard currency, to build industrial strengths of the Soviet Union. And many, many people died. I think, uh, I, think I wrote it down here. 3.5 3 to 5 million people died in this famine that was a forced famine. And this is a very, very beautiful memorial. If you've been watching CNN and MSNBC like I have, you probably have seen this man kneeling, who's kneeling there. That's Petro Poroshenko. He was the president of Ukraine prior to the man who's president now. You've probably seen him in battle fatigues and things on TV. And he was there for the unveiling of this. It's an extraordinary a memorial. And if you want to know more about it, there's an exhibition at the University of Maryland School of Architecture's gallery that explains the whole Holodomor. It's really worth seeing. We've had it up there a couple of years now because it's such a really fine exhibition, all about the design and the building of it. Anyhow, so 1930s, 32 was very tragic. What is really essential to understand about all this before I go into talking about Kiev and Odessa is, is topography. It's fundamentally flat. It doesn't really have any natural borders except for the Carpathian Mountains in the southwest and, and, the, um, and the Black Sea. So as, as my wife observed when we were at the World War II Memorial in Kyiv, you could just imagine the Germans blowing across Ukraine in 1941 and then the Red Army coming across you know, two or three years later and waves of destruction with each of these things. There was really nothing to stop them. <coughs> um, when you go back and you look at history a little bit more, um, what I've done on the maps on the left is outline what Ukraine was in uh, Europe pre-World War I, um, which is, um, you can see the piece of it that was part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire in, in yellow on the upper map. <clears throat> on the lower map, after the disappearance of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, the way in which Poland, um, this is the part that was taken from Poland, but, but you can see what happened after World War I. Um, <clears throat> the Poland received some of that territory. One of the reasons why um, <clears throat> that Putin is telling people there are Nazis in Ukraine is because of this upper map, because the western part of Ukraine, which was part of the Habsburg Empire, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, many people there sided with the Germans. So they fought on behalf of the Germans in World War II, not on behalf of the, of the Russians and the Soviet Union. So that's one of the complications of history there. And there are far right political parties in far western Ukraine that, that still exist today. That, um, but, but you know, it's a democracy. People get to say what they want, right? But nonetheless, they still exist. Um, when you look at the architecture of these places, you can see it right away. I mean, if you look at Lviv, which is the largest city in western Ukraine, and then compare it to Kharkiv, which has been the subject of bombing, you can see Kharkiv is much more of a Slavic city, and, and Lviv is much more of a Catholic Habsburg town. And you can kind of see it in the architecture, in the churches, and in the, the kind of fabric that the cities build. Um, so getting on to these cities, this is um, on the left side is Odessa and on the right side is, is Kyiv. Um, and notice the Ukrainian pronunciation is Kyiv, not Kiev. Just want to make that clear. And the Ukrainian spelling of Odessa is with one S, not two. Just want to, so people know. Um, so you all will follow that from here on out, right? Any event, um, Kyiv on the right, which clearly was a city that grew over time, here and on the left side, you can see Odessa, which was clearly a city that was planned pretty much all at once. And I'll talk about those differences. Uh, so let's start with Kyiv. And you can see the, the sort of complex um, sort of fortifications and topography that this um, 18th century map sort of, sort of commemorates. Um, there's the, probably some of the pictures that you see of it today um, of the downtown and Krushavtik Boulevard and the, the Maidan, the Maidan Nazaloznosti, which means the independent square in the foreground. Um, as I mentioned, Kiev is um, in the center, upper center, it's just south of Chernobyl, where the um, nuclear um, meltdown was um, 
many years ago, and the Russians seemed to think they needed to capture it, and now they've given it back. But one of the things, if you squint your eyes and look, you can see the route of the Dnieper River that runs through the middle of the country. And of course, being a trading place, the river was very advantageous for that because it could facilitate the movement of goods and it gets you down to the Black Sea. So it's a very, very important um, geographic characteristics. And Odessa, of course, sits on the Black Sea. Now, this is interesting. On the right side is the, um, the, the, uh, the, the tributaries of the Dnipro um, and all the different connections it made well up into what is now Belarus and towards Lithuania. So it would have been easy to have at least some trade coming down those, those rivers there. You can see the importance of Kiev there. And Odessa is sort of at the mouth of that, a little bit further west there. But a couple of things to point out on the upper map on the left side, you can see the Dnieper, and sometimes they built canals. So you can see a Dnieper canal. The, the Dnieper, Dnieper has a, has a sub-tributary, uh, the Pripyat, which has a canal that connects it to Brest and further uh, west in what is Belarus and Poland. So you can see these were canal systems that facilitated trade. One of the most important ones was in the lower left, which was a canal that was dug to um, bring fresh water to Crimea. Crimea itself doesn't really have any fresh water bodies, water bodies of water that are fresh. So one of the reasons why Putin is so um, interested in conquering that part of the world was to reestablish the ability to get fresh water into Crimea, which is a major issue for the survivability in that place, um, surrounded by salt water or brackish water. And one of the things the Ukrainians did when the Russians first took over Crimea was they cut off the canal and said, take that, you know. And so that's that's a major issue here. Um, you can see when you look at the Google Earth images, the sort of alluvial plain that Kiev sits in, a um, large reservoir, body of water to the, to the north, the airport that the Russians first thought they were gonna land in and go in and use that airport as a staging area to take over the city is in the upper left corner of the, of the drawing, of the photograph there. And you can see a little bit of how that territory lays out. Um, it is largely flat, but the city itself, the older historical city, sits on a bluff. And we'll talk a little bit about the, the characteristics of that. Um, what you can see here is, oh, water. Oh, so nice. Thank you very much. Uh, water, water, good. Um, you can see a little bit on the slide on the left is Podil, the lower district, which was a sort of industrial area that grew next to the river. And the slide on the right gives you a sense of this bluff that sort of the city sits behind. Um, <clears throat> in the 18th century maps, um, I'm going to try this drawing thing here. Okay, Lorenzo, we'll see if this works. Um, you can see here, here's the river, right? And this is the original settlement. So that's St. Sophia's there and the original fortification. Look at this area, we're gonna come back to this. This is the beginning of Krishatik, which is the main street in town that comes along this valley between these two hillsides. But you can see the extent to which this bluff runs along the, the, uh, the uh, topography there. You go up onto it. And then in the, starting in the 18th century, uh, this sort of little workers district here, Podil, which itself was destroyed by fire in 1811. But you can see the general characteristics of the walled city, the Golden Gate of Kiev is sort of right in that location there. Um, these historical maps are terrific because you can read the topography absolutely without any kind of ambiguity. Um, later on, this is a map from the 19th century after the building, rebuilding of this part of uh, the city. This is Podil, was rebuilt with a gridded plan there. But you can see here, this is the St. Sophia complex, which is the important church complex. Here, and then the walled city along there, the Golden Gate of Kiev. we'll talk about that in a second. And you can see Kershatik beginning to emerge with a series of streets that sort of have a trident or radial form that stretch up and connect the upper hill down to this lower street that's going to sort of extend off into the countryside and the Caves Monastery being over in this area and this area all sort of filling in in between. So it has a very complex topography, interesting but complex topography to understand it. And you, a picture like this gives you a sense. The upper city is on the right part of the slide. Here was St. Andrew's Church there, and the lower part is of the 18th century Podil neighborhood there, and then these sort of wooded uh, hillsides on, on, uh, on slope down to the river. 
Um, when you start to look at the old city and you see the, the walls of the old city, which you can see clearly on the left, you can see the remnants of that or the residue of that on the right. You can see the St. Sophia complex, which is in those locations. This is the Maidan here, the major square. And you can see this radial system of streets that was starting to emerge. Of course, it was very typical for medieval cities to have streets that converged on city gates. So there was obviously a way in and out of the city that once the walls get torn down, gets opened up. But the residue and the sort of imprint of those streets remains there and they connect up the hillside. This, this St. Sophia's has an axis down to St. Michael's here, which has a very large church in this location that the Soviets destroyed that's been rebuilt, a very large Soviet office building. But, but you can see the imprint of history there quite extraordinarily. Um, it has very beautiful fabric from modern buildings on the right to more sort of Gothic or Baroque or whatever, but they fill out the street and make some really, really wonderful streets. Um, it's quite characteristic to have these kind of bay windows that are almost like solariums on the outside. You see this quite often in, in this part of the world, but really a beautiful, robust sort of 19th century commercial architecture. Um, and then things like, you know, you turn your head, you look down one street, and it looks a little bit like it could be in St. Petersburg, and another street, you turn your head, it looks like it could be in Vienna. I mean, so the influences were, were very, very, um, very widespread. Um, and then this is just a diagram, you know, the original town, the expansion, and where all these different places are. The three most important sort of tourist sites in the city are um, these three elements, most of them having, to, having their origins in the 11th century, um, built under the um, watchful eye of Yaroslav the Wise, who was the ruler then, um, and various things like delivering the city um, in battles against nomadic hordes and things like that. He built the Golden Gate as a way to fortify the city after a particular battle, and St. Sophia's he built uh, to um, thank the uh, intervention of the Virgin for delivering them from a siege there. The Golden Gate, of course, was only reconstructed. Nobody really knows what it looked like, but it was reconstructed in 1982 based upon descriptions. And the idea was that they put a small chapel on the top with a golden dome to, to a chapel to the, to the uh, Blessed Virgin Mary to thank her for her intervention there. So that's very well known. And the Caves Monastery, was a monastery that was started by a Greek monk in the 11th century, um, around 51, up on the hillside. I did hear it start. Somebody might mute there. Here comes Lorenzo. Do you want to mute somebody? It started. Uh oh, somebody's about to get muted. Is he up now? Somebody got muted. He's probably not making noise. No, no, not him. Don't him. He's not. He's not making noise. No, it's somebody else. All right, well, let's calm down. If they act up again, Lorenzo. Well, if they act up again, Lorenzo, we'll, we'll, we'll stick your IT friends on. Um, so the Prashuric Monastery on the on the uphill side or on the on the hillside was started as a series of caves in this hillside and has some of the most extraordinary architecture you will find of, of um, this period. And they kept adding to it and adding to it over the centuries. Um, and these are some views of it. And you can see here the hillside that it sits up on the river. And then what you see in the distance is what the Soviets built after World War II, was miles and miles and miles of prefabricated housing. Um, the Caves Monastery is very well known for these underground caves. Uh, the buildings on top are beautiful and extraordinary. And this is where I discovered that I had claustrophobia because I went down in these caves. They give you one stinking little candle to walk around, and it was totally terrifying, and I had to get out of there. I think I ruined the afternoon for a number of people that were having a very religious experience there, but um, <laughs> it was a panic attack. But nonetheless, it's really the buildings are rather extraordinary. Um, and then the Golden Gate here is, is quite a beautiful thing. And St. Sophia's is what you would see in this part of the world with these kinds of frescoes and things of this period. Um, the other astonishing thing in Kiev is the, um, the World War II Memorial, which is a giant statue of a woman with a raised sword um, and lots of uh, Soviet realist statues out front. Uh, we went to see this, you know, this is a country, Ukraine itself lost um, 
you know, between six and eight million people in World War II, about 1.5 million Jews from UK were killed by the Germans, which is extraordinary. There was not a word of it in English in the museum, and it was one of the most astonishing museums I've ever been in. It was very moving. In any event, so let's talk a little bit about Krushatik. Krushatik is the main um, boulevard in Kiev, which runs between these two hillsides, as I mentioned, and connects up to the old town. Um, and you can see the sort of diagram of that connection here. And this drawing on top is a is a 18th century view of it. And you can start to see, you know, the emergence of the square here. And you can see these connections up to Saint Sophia and other roads going up the hillside to Saint Michael's there. And then you can see the Krushatik originally began with some aristocratic houses being built in this valley between the two. A rather, a rather um, interesting sort of, uh, and not uncommon for that kind of, uh, for those days when they used to build streets in stream valleys and they just covered in the valley and put it with the stream and put it on the street. And then the next thing you know, they had a, had a nice urban street. Um, our first visit to Kiev, this is us there, that's Cheryl on the left there. Our first visit there was our translator, who was quite happy to go around with us. It was rather extraordinary. And I want to talk about some of this architecture, which I think is really worth, worth looking at. Um, when I was there, I started to look at Kiev and make some sketches and try and understand its urban formulation, in particular Krushatik. Um, so I made a sketch from my notebook there on the left, and I came back and I found an article that, that an architect had written about the, the Soviet rebuilding of the city. What happened was that as the Germans were coming in 1941, the partisans, as they retreated, mined all the buildings. And two days after the Germans arrived, they blew up the center of Kiev and, um, and destroyed all those areas in black. And then this is a diagram that just shows the basically the operative ones are the red and the yellow, which was pretty much destroyed in the war. Some of it was destroyed shortly after, but that's all that was destroyed in Kiev. Um, so it's a significant part of the center of the city, and it was the main street. This, um, this is just as a way of sidelight. This is sort of um, something I've been looking at, which is the arch as I mentioned, the architecture of an urban design of cities in, that are rebuilt after catastrophic events. And I don't have, obviously, all the examples I've been looking at. And some of these you folks may know, but places like Lisbon, which suffered a, a, a uh, Richter scale of about nine earthquake and tsunami in 1755 at about 11 AM on All Saints Day and wiped out the center of Lisbon, or even places like Thessaloniki in 1917, which had a huge fire that wiped out a very, very large part of the town and sort of exacerbated the, the exodus of, of people who were not Orthodox, of the Orthodox religion from the city. So you saw Lisbon rebuilt as a sort of gridded uh, Baroque Renaissance city. And then Thessaloniki um, rebuilt in a most astonishing way with a Baroque plan and this fantastic colonnaded street that runs up from, from the water. I mean, what is extraordinary about these rebuildings is that they typically um, rebuilt them in prior, before modernism, right? They just assumed an urban intent. So the cities were rebuilt as urbanism, but the style oftentimes in the architectural theory was updated. And in many cases, the technology was updated. So for example, in Lisbon, the buildings were all built out of wood with a masonry facade as cages so they could be anti-seismic design. So the technology was integrated into it. And, and in other places, there are interesting examples of that. But up until the, you know, the rise and the proliferation of modern urbanism, many of these places were rebuilt in interesting ways. They weren't reconstructed, but rebuilt with an assumption that we're rebuilding a city here, not something else. So you have examples like Warsaw, which was fundamentally reconstructed from old paintings. There, They painstakingly went back and looked at paintings and reconstructed the entire the entire old town, and today it's a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Um, there are some interesting ones that, that didn't quite happen as we thought they might have. Places like saint dier in uh, eastern France, where Corbu famously did a large reconstruction uh, plan, or a large urban design plan in red here, uh, and everything else was wiped out that's not in, in black, uh, was rejected by the local citizenry, and they rebuilt the sort of urban main street and, and with repetitive facades. And near as I can tell, I think they made the extraordinarily right decision, and they have a town again, rather than what Corbu would have left them, which I think would have been a great tragedy. 
Um, then there are interesting people like Andre Lursat, who was tasked with rebuilding Mauberge after um, World War II, who um, was a modernist, but he was trying to use modern elements of the of his in his lexicon to make urban buildings. Uh, so you see things like this. He takes this Vauban fortress town and makes these interventions in red. Um, the most interesting one I've come across in this regard is St. Malo of 1945, which is in Brittany on the coast of France. The 1944, the Americans and the British seemed to think there was a, several German garrisons there. It turned out not to be true, but um, leveled the place pretty well. And you can see, you know, this is on the right, some reconstructions, and you can see on the left much of which was destroyed. Um, they made some very interesting decisions in this place which was, this is a figure ground on the left of what was there and a figure ground on the right of, of what was left once it was destroyed. So it's a question of collaging all this stuff back together, um, putting the pieces back together. What they did in St. Malo was, and you can see the, the before and after, they, they put the street grid back, but instead of making really small medieval courtyards and things, they made sort of nominal building dimensions with courtyards and put the street grid back, but they improved it by having a little bit more light air and sunshine in the center of the blocks. So, which I think was a really interesting strategy here, one that, one that I think deserves a little bit more attention. Um, and you know, the, the place today is one of the most popular places to visit in Britain, so you can see, We've been making drawings of figure grounds showing the, the um, different stages and different ways of reading it. And the one on the right is the overlay of the old plan and the new plan. And you can see the extent to which they deviated from it or, or tried to uh, replicate it. Um, and then the two things together, certainly a little bit less dense, but I think walking around, you might be hard pressed to, to really see that it had been reconstructed after the war or rebuilt. They salvaged all the blocks, they salvaged uh, a lot of the building pieces to use it to put the buildings back together, which, um, you know, the details are a little bit different, but it's an extraordinary undertaking to be able to do this. And then some of the streets, some of the real small streets that they had in the plan, instead of putting the streets back, they stretched the building over and put archways through the courtyards, which was an interesting sort of innovation for it. So um, I think a, a strategy that I think worked out very well for, for this town. Um, so talking about Kiev from 1947 onwards from when it was blown up, you can see on the upper right is one of the pieces that was built after the war called the Kiev Passage. Um, Kiev itself had a very you know, characteristic 19th century kind of fabric to it, two and three story buildings in some places, some large uh, palaces, uh, Kershatik, these two pictures are of Kershatik, was about you know, 75 feet across, maybe. Um, it was a wide street for, for its time. Um, and then you can see here, this is Krishaptik looking down one street, and on the right is the Kiev City Hall that used to sit at the head of the Maidan uh, Plaza there. And this is what all this, this looked like. Um, the Maidan itself, the sort of uh, streets that run up to the old town that I was pointing out before, was two and three story buildings sitting facing that. And this is a little bit, if you've ever been to Istanbul and been to um, Taxing Square with the trolley that goes around the circle there, it's a little bit like that, that goes around the center of, uh, went around the center of the space. Of course, it doesn't exist anymore. Um, it gets blown up. Uh, this is the Germans probably on the day. Um, or two after these explosions started going off once they entered Kiev. Um, and then you can see the destruction that happened. And this is, you know, the place was level. These buildings were, were, were on fire and, and burned down pretty quickly, I suspect. Um, and even some of the churches, the historic churches were, were built, uh, were burned down as well in the process. Um, you can see here the city hall, the Kiev city hall on the right, there and then St. Sophia's up the hill, which they did not bomb. The partisans did not wire to blow up. I think they, interestingly, they blew up most of the commercial part, but not the monuments, which was probably a smart move. <laughs> it's gonna blow something up, I suppose. Um, but you can see this is Kershatik in terms of what it looked like after, after the war, or perhaps even during the war. And then this is a picture of the Soviet army coming back in in 1943 and what they were left with. There. there was some fighting that occurred with the Germans as they entered the city. So what we've done is a similar thing that I was showing for the town in France. We've sort of taken and done reconstruction figure grounds 
of uh, what was there before and what um, was there today. This is what uh, Kyiv looked like prior to World War II, and you can see the city fabric is pretty cogent. The blocks are actually quite large in Kyiv, and I haven't quite figured out why they built such large blocks, but um, you can see the pattern, you can see the radial uh, pattern of streets coming out of uh, the Maidan, and you can see Krishatik as the spine sort of running down, obviously, this, this whole piece here, down to the market here, you know, and then St. Sophia's is this complex, and St. Michael's is that complex here. Um, this is what was blown up, um, so you can see what was taken out, we put in gray there. There were a couple of streets that were left, there's one in particular, sort of a residential version of the Uffizi that was left here, um, that, that is a very nice piece, I'll show you a picture of that. But that's basically the context that these architects had to deal with which is, you know, a huge piece of the city was missing. And you can see, you know, a tremendous gap between the Pesherk neighborhood on the right, which leads up to the, the presidential palace where Zelensky mostly is, is up here, up in this area. And the monasteries are down here. But, you know, the old town is here. You can see this huge gap between these two uh, parts of the city. There. So they're, they're, in a way, have to figure out how to kind of put this all back together, and they weren't going to put it back and reconstruct it like Warsaw. I think the idea, the ethos with the Soviet architects was, we're going to make something better, we're going to improve it. So in red is what they did, and you can see they made the street wider, Krushatik got wider. They rebuilt the Maidan Square with an interesting architecture. And they made these kind of liner buildings on the edges. So these liner buildings, like you see in the, the Podil Arcade here on the left, these liner buildings were sort of archways and gateways to the residential neighborhoods up the hill. And so they made some really fantastic sort of urban ensembles like this, this building on the left that was an archway over into the new neighborhood there. And you can see here, this is what it looks like. Um, this view in particular is looking sort of at this building here, which is this building there. And there's a sort of governmental side on one side of the street, which is over here. And there's a residential side on the other side of the street, which is on, on, the, on the east side. Um, but really kind of, and that picture doesn't do it justice. Don't worry, I have better, but here we go. And then um, they built building, interesting buildings where they had bases that had retail shops that filled out the street and residential buildings up above. Um, so they built them out of these sort of towers. But interestingly, it was asymmetrical in program, so they had the government buildings on one side, the residential buildings on the other, and they inserted a linear park on the residential side. I've never seen this anywhere else, where they said, okay, we're gonna you know, put on the residential side a linear park with stores, and that's gonna be one of the main characteristic elements of how this whole edge of the street is going to be developed. Um, so there was, this was also the result of a competition. There were interesting proposals put forward as part of this competition. So you can see this is the Maidan and they, they made, one guy had sort of arches over all the streets and a kind of centralized sort of axis into a, into a city hall building there. Um, and then this is another one. This is the Maidan in the foreground with a circular piazza here and then arches over each of the streets. Very, very monumental here with Krushatik going off in that direction. Uh, almost, almost Greek with its fixation on temples rather than building city fabric in this particular solution. I think they probably chose the right one. Just to give you a little bit of context, this is the same scale of Kiev compared to Paris. Um, so it's a little bit different. Paris has much denser blocks, tighter streets and things. Kiev has larger blocks with complexities of gardens and other buildings in the side of the blocks and whatnot, um, but, it, but it, you know, it's characteristically very different. And then this is it compared to Washington, D.C., so you can get a sense of the size of these two things. Um, you know, probably compares, certainly Kirchhoff compares with the width of streets like Pennsylvania Avenue, or even with the mall in some cases. So what you see is on the, on the west side, which is on the right, government buildings like city halls and city council offices and post offices and banks of the state on the right and on the, on the um, east side, which is on the left side of the photo, 
an interesting wall of residential buildings with this linear park that extends along one side. So they, they tripled the width of the street, more or less, in some places. They've greatly widened it and inserted this park. They, by the way, today they closed the street so people on Sundays, maybe on Saturdays, so people can rollerblade and whatnot up and down the street. Anyhow, so, so you can see the government side here, which is some very uh, spectacularly good monumental classical architecture. You know, people frequently say, oh, it's just Stalinist architecture. It's like anything else. There were very good architects operating then, and there were some people who were probably a little bit clunky. But they made urbanism, and these guys, I think, were really quite quite skilled in making the street wall and making urban buildings and much larger urban buildings that had existed before. And I think you know you can kind of think of this as well. Um, it was related to things like the Federal Triangle. This is only about ten years or so after the building of the Federal Triangle, and many of the architects who were operating in the Soviet Union at the time, some of them had actually studied at the Ecole de Beaux Arts and had that kind of training as much in the same way that our American architects like Arthur Brown did the Federal Triangle. So I think there's some affinity there, certainly for one side of the street. So you can see here the, the Maidan, it's rebuilding, and you can see the sort of civic side of the street here. And then if you look, you can see the opposite side. I'll talk about that in a second, but these sort of very large buildings along that side. These are some pictures from the Soviet era. <coughs> it looks a little gloomy here. It's, I can assure you it's actually not, not a gloomy place at all. Um, and then these are those streets, and then, so they rebuilt it with buildings and lodges that turned corners and things. This is the main post office with, with a post office bank inside in the middle of Kiev. There and then this is City Hall, the City Council headquarters, and the, the location where the mayor's um, offices are. And you can see the way they use these arches to lead into courtyards in the center of the block. Um, a rather skilled sort of uh, sort of House of Raphael by Bramante sort of thing. You know, the rusticated base with the colonnade up above, um, but several stories tall. Um, one of the most beautiful things I learned in street furniture there. This is the most exquisite lamppost I've ever seen. Here's the lamppost, but look at this base where you actually have a little seat on either side there. I mean, talk about a beautiful piece of civic art to encourage people to sit and talk and rest. It's, it's, it's really beautiful. It's rather extraordinary. And then the other side, you can see the classical buildings of the, of the government buildings and then the department store um, here, which oftentimes is referred to as a kind of futurist Soviet constructivist model. I see a little bit more of Louis Sullivan in that than I see of constructivists on it, Mark. You, you agree, right? Yeah. So these guys were all looking at people, other architects, and this is the main department store in the center of Key there. And then they use it for parades. I think one of the ideas behind widening the street was to, to have a parade ground there, and so the Ukrainians um, uh, do that as well. By the way, the black and red flag is the ultra hard right uh, political party in Kyiv. So you will see that in some of these, some of these pictures. Um, and on the east side of the street is the more residential side. And you can see a number of things, a number of archways that they use. This was an existing sort of Uffizi-like street. Here, there's another archway here and another plaza that terminates this street. Um, so a very clever weaving of these buildings with the existing buildings in the neighborhood. Um, and then you can see that side of it with the linear linear park uh, slipping down one side. Um, what is it, also an interesting thing is the Soviets went around to most of the cities that they had either in Russia or satellite countries like Poland and other places and famously built these wedding cake uh, skyscraper buildings and probably you've seen pictures of them and that's Kiev's version of it but I think they got a much better deal than other places did. And I'll talk about that in a second. But this is the, 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 the street on the retail side. And you can see the, the department store I was mentioning on the right. And then you can see there's sort of a grade change where this, is, this park is actually changes levels. So in actual fact, when you're walking along the street on the stores on the left side, you're up about two to three meters higher than the level of Krushatik. And so you're not really set down to the level of traffic. And it, it's really quite brilliantly done. And I made a little sketch of that to just show, you know, how that all works. It was quite a surprise. I've never really seen anything like it anyplace else. And the shopping zone enjoys this buffer from, from the large boulevard. 
And you can see a little bit of how that works here. And most of these rather monumental buildings shift character at the base and are mostly glass for storefronts and things um, down at the base of the buildings. Um, and then, as I mentioned before, this is, the, this is my sketch of the Padul um, Passage, but you can see the way this retail sort of wraps around this. And then this becomes, this is the archway back into the existing neighborhood, very skillfully done. And another one of these archways going up into the, this one has stairs inside of it, all these residential buildings. And from the other side, looking out into the city hall building, you can see this is that, that sort of <coughs> Keeves version of the Uffizi residential passage and the archway at the end of the street that, that transitions from Kershatik into the neighborhood. <coughs> this building is very interesting. This is, terminates the end of the street. It's largely a residential building with a plaza and a series of gardens that step up to it. And I just want to sort of, this is Keeves' version of one of Moscow's Seven Sisters, which were these wedding cake skyscrapers that were built uh, throughout Moscow. One of them, number five in the drawing, was supposed to be the Palace of the Soviets. Corbusier, of course, did the famous competition entry for that. But they all are slightly different from each other with various terraces, and pinnacles, and things like that. And most of them are kind of object buildings. But what's interesting about them is they're not so very different in certain respects, the ones that are better urban examples from what was being built in New York at the time. And apparently the rumor had it that Stalin saw McKibbe, a picture of McKibbe and White's uh, municipal building on the right said, we want to be able to build just like that. So there's the inspiration for these things from the Waldorf Astoria to the Biltmore and Coral Gables. So they built seven of these. And that's one in Moscow to the left. What is interesting about the one in Kiev is that the two front pieces actually engage the fabric of the city. So instead of it being a monumental building set apart, the front buildings actually form the square and actually make a line of, of, urban, of urban fabric along that east side of, the, of Kershatik along the, along the park and do a very, very fine job of having retail and other sorts of things at the ground level. So a building is both object and fabric. It makes both the city wall and the city fabric, but also has the tower that terminates the major street. So you can see some pictures of that here. Um, really interesting um, things. And then you, you can see the way the retail is adapted to the ground level of on the slide on the right, where you have many, many different stores going along there. And then, of course, it's broken by the plaza here on the right. Um, Nezavas Nosti Independence Square was rebuilt as well uh, with these buildings, these um, six, I think they're six story buildings, maybe seven, and these towers in the center, all slightly different from each other. And you can see what it was like before the, um, before the, the war and then how they rebuilt it afterwards. You know, I got to think that there was some inspiration for the scenographic nature of this square and how these buildings relate to it that was inspired by things like the Piazza del Popolo. Piazza del Popolo has three streets, so this has six, so maybe it's twice as good. No, but um, <laughs> it's different. But you can see the, the sort of scenographic urbanism being in the minds of these architects, saying here's an opportunity for us to make something that's much more coordinated and, and, and uh, focused on the, the scale of the square. Um, and then various pictures of the Maidan. Um, the white building in the center is the Conservatory of Music. And then one of the first things they did after independence was they built an underground shopping mall underneath the square. And that's what you can see with the skylights there. Now, you might think that was a bad idea, except my daughter and I were in that underground mall when we went back to visit in 2015, and we got to talking to one of the storekeepers. And he told me that the good thing the mall was there because they used it as a first aid station during the the, the uh, uprising in 2014. And a lot of the people who were injured were brought down there and given first aid at the level underneath the square when the government troops attacked them. So these are some more pictures of the end of the Nizalas uh, Nosti, the Maidan, and some pictures of different directions there. They built a later version of the wedding cake uh, skyscraper at the end of the axis here, which it's not as successful as the other one, but it was sort of the same kind of DNA. And you can see the, the, uh, the, uh, the shopping center there. A couple more pictures there. 
It's really quite quite striking. And then you can see, again, this linear part. I've never seen anything like it. Some of the residential fabric. So we then went to Odessa in 2003. Odessa is a very different story. Um, <clears throat> it sits on the Black Sea, um, but it has an interesting history. And these two men played a very important role in it. Uh, the first fellow on the left is a Spanish, um, Spanish prince royalty who was born in Naples, of all places, of course, having a Spanish prince born in Naples in the, in the um, 16, in the 1700s would not have been unusual. But he was the first military commander working in the service of the Imperial Russian Army to claim that part of the world for Imperial Russia. He was working for Catherine the Great and her, uh, her empire and suggested that this would be a good place to take over. So they were able to sort of overtake a Turkish fort and stick a flag in the ground for Catherine the Great. Interestingly, so he, he founds it. The fellow on the right um, was the Duke de Richelieu, who later in the, in the 1820s becomes prime minister of France twice. He was the first governor of the Odessa region, and he had been friends with um, Tsar Alexander, who appointed him to be governor here. And of course, if he had been hanging around uh, Paris in the 1790s, he probably wouldn't have been alive then. He probably would have had his head chopped off. But nonetheless, these two folks figure very prominently. And of course, Catherine the Great, in her, in her ambitions, when it was suggested to her that they set up a colony here, she said, of course, because it was a warm water port. And Russia only had hot, cold water ports that froze up. So Odessa is on the Black Sea. It almost never freezes. And that's a statue of her. And all the men, like the two I just mentioned, um, De Ribas and um, um, Richelieu, are in, uh, below her in the statue. The two of the main streets in town are called Richelieuskaya and De Ribaskuskaya. So they've got their names named after streets. Um, it's founded in 1793, laid out, it's a little bit like Washington in that the streets are 90 feet and tree-lined and the blocks are about 425 feet square, so it has large blocks, but tree-lined streets not unlike what you see in Washington, D.C. Uh, basically a grid plan with neoclassical buildings, mostly oriented on the north-south. There, uh, this is me sketching it, <coughs> excuse me, in, um, in our visit in 2003. I found this, which was interesting, which is this city was populated. Odessa was the fourth most important city in the Russian Empire in the 19th century because of its port activities. It was also a port of Franco, meaning it was a free port. So merchandise could come in there without taxation. So it grew quite a bit um, under, with those sorts of um, um, freedoms there. And it eventually transformed from being a largely Russian speaking town um, or Russian ethnicity to more recently Ukrainian. And you can see that transformation over time here as it, as it proceeded. Um, it has some extraordinary architecture as well. This is one of the, this is actually an apartment complex. It's nothing more than that. This has these two uh, gentlemen holding up the corner of the building there. Um, it has some extraordinary streets. This is Primorsky Prospect that overlooks the harbor. Um, which is um, a, you know, a very, very important port, um, as I mentioned there. Um, I sort of sketched it out a little bit to try and understand the dimensions, but it's extraordinarily simple and beautiful and with lovely buildings uh, defining the space. Um, and that's the relationship of the opera house and to the port beyond. It sits up on a bluff, so it's, it's easily, not easily defended, but it certainly is, is, enjoys a very nice characteristic of overlooking the Black Sea from about two or three stories above, probably about three stories above, above the level of the water. Um, the main square is this square, and, and Richelieu um, is commemorated there, a toga and a uh, laurel wreath in the statue there. Um, it's all sort of barricaded now with sandbags and whatnot. And then those are the Potemkin steps, uh, famous steps that go down from the main square down to the waterfront. Keep those in mind because I just want to return to them in a second. Here, here's Richelieu in sandbag the other day protecting him on um, his bronze statue there. And there's Potemkin steps there. And you may remember the Sergei Eisenstein movie, The Battleship Potemkin. We're going to come back to that in a second. It's a famous silent film that these were in. 
and some of the fabric of the city, which is extraordinary. It's sort of a Slavic Baroque fabric. It's really wonderful. And then a really extraordinary opera house. Um, most of the neighborhoods that were built, um, you know, after the war in the 1950s when the Soviets went into mass production for their housing estates, um, looked like this with large slabs. Uh, contorted sometimes in different shapes or just marching along, very little definition of public space. Although the streets tend to be lined with um, London plane trees, not in this example, but Odessa and Kyiv, the areas that were bombed outside of Kyiv and Mariupol are largely these neighborhoods that were, you know, Russia had a huge need for housing, or the Soviet Union had a huge need for housing after the war. Um, this is our daughter here waving hi to us when, when we were adopting her. The orphanage is oftentimes set in the middle of these complexes, so schools and orphanages and stores sit in the middle of these complexes. This one in Kyiv on the left had a fantastic mural of this woman and all these children behind her, that the state was taking care of all the kids, and actually had some Corbusian overtones. It had bulldozed stairs and glass block and windows and things like that, so whoever the architects were, working on these were well aware of what their contemporaries were doing <clears throat> on the other side of the Iron Curtain. Much of the American money in adoption goes to improving these facilities. So what you see in, in the bottom right is an improvement to one of the orphanages in Odessa where they're making a new playground for the kids. So the Maidan Revolution happens in 2014. Um, and the, the, you know, it's named after the square, the main square in Kyiv, when the Ukrainians rose up and threw out a corrupt government and a corrupt leader who was a sort of miniature Putin. Um, and the pictures of this are astonishing. You know, there were terrible fights between the militia under orders of the president, and buildings were set on fire, and people were camped out, and over 100 people died. Um, in, these, in these skirmishes between the, the police and the, and the protesters. Um, they badly want to be part of the European Union. Um, maybe they can't be part of NATO, but I think they should be part of the EU, or at least, you know, that's not certainly for me to decide, but it's for them to decide there. Um, you know, these spaces are rather extraordinary places. You know, when we think about public space, like the Maidan, it's interesting how important public space is. And you think about, you know, Václav Havel in Prague on the upper left, and you think about our mayor, Mayor Bowser, and Black Lives Matter. These, these important public events are played out in very important places, in places that are important to us in terms of our culture and what we value politically. And certainly the Maidan is to Ukrainians what Black Lives Matter plaza today is to many of us in Washington, D.C., or Wenceslas Square is to people of the Czech Republic. So we went back in 2015. Uh, these are the folks, that's our daughter Amory in the center, and that's the people who helped us. And I've been in touch with all of them, um, and they're fine. They all are in Kyiv. Uh, the woman who was our, um, our caseworker, Larissa, is on the far right, an extraordinary woman. She wouldn't leave. She said, no, nope, I'm not leaving, I'm staying here. And that's her daughter who has a degree from Iowa State in uh, business there. And so we went back to show Amory where she came from and it was an extraordinary visit. And took her back to her orphanage and she was greeted there like returning royalty, which was extraordinary. And I'm very sure that all the women and the doctors and everybody who work at these orphanages with these kids stayed right there during all the Russian bombing and things because they were just not going to abandon these kids. They were extraordinarily dedicated people. But one of the things you see in Kyiv are these street monuments to the people who were killed during the Maidan Revolution. Some of them are kind of ad hoc and impromptu, but extraordinarily moving, extraordinarily powerful as you walk down the street and see them. And some of them have been formalized with pictures of the people who died there. Some of the older folks come on a daily basis and pay their respects to the people who sacrificed their lives to try and have freedom in this country. And I just want to end on, let's see, Lorenzo, did Lorenzo leave? Let's see. I want to end on one thing which I think is rather, rather amazing. Um, if we can play this, this is a scene from the end of the movie, The Battleship Potemkin. And it's an important, as I mentioned before, silent movie from 1925. 
and it's about an uprising of uh, you know sailors against the imperial navy of the Tsar, and the townspeople of Odessa are going down the um, steps um, to um, greet them in the port uh, because there's been this uprising, a sailor's been killed, and this is a very famous scene from the history of movies there. But what is extraordinary to me in watching this again the other night was the fact that the, the um, Cossacks come and shoot the civilians in the same way that's what's happening today. It's just about a minute long. And it's a very famous scene. Here come the Cossacks. A famous scene where a woman is shot and her baby's carriage starts to go down the stairs. And you can imagine that there's a scene like this being played out in this country, albeit with different weapons, but with the same result. Hard to imagine that this is. We're a, not seeing it. They're not seeing it. Yeah, people. That's what I was worried about. They're not seeing it. We're not sharing that. Oh, you're not sharing that. All right, I'm sorry. So, should we share the screen? Yes. Stop sharing. All right. Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was. <laughs> but anything worth doing is worth <laughs> doing again, right? So this will work, Lorenzo? Yeah. Are you all seeing it? Yes. Okay, thank you. The, the, the heinous disregard for human life is unbelievable. say the conclusion I draw from this is this is not something that is new to this culture, to these leaders. So can they see this? I'm sure. We're sharing this. So that's, that's my talk, folks, and the only thing I can say to conclude is 
<clears throat> I hope people who have listened to this, perhaps you were inspired before to do what you can to help these folks in Ukraine, and I hope maybe after this talk you're inspired a little bit more to do what you can to help them because they need our help. And we can do a lot for them. We've done a lot, but we can do more. And these are great places, these are great people, and they don't deserve what's being done to them right now. So thank you, Mark, for inviting me. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you for making it personal. Are there any questions people want to ask? Are there questions of people in the chat or anything? Should we? <clears throat> I don't know if I see. Yeah, mostly people complaining about not seeing the video. That's, <laughs> I can't blame them for that, that's for sure. Well, thank, thank you all for coming. I, I um, appreciate the opportunity. I hope you all get to visit these places in peace and appreciate them the way we can appreciate them. So. All right. Thank you. Uh, there are some cookies and chips. Oh, great. OK. All right. Stop sharing. Did you stop sharing? Yeah, go ahead.